as long as everyone can hear me. So I'd like to uh, open this meeting of the June 2021 Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Um, we uh, have a full day ahead of us today. We're gonna start with a presentation by Dr. Richard Cody on the MRIP 2020 estimates. Uh, but before we do, I have a couple of announcements. The first is that we have a couple liaisons with us here today. Anna Beckwith with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council is with us. As, uh, and Rick Bellavance is going to be sitting in for the New England Council. Um, Eric Reed, who typically um, serves as that li as the liaison for New England, is going to be participating as a ASMFC uh, commissioner uh, today during our joint meeting. And so um, uh, Rick will be serving as a New England uh, Council liaison with us today. We also have a number of folks from ASFC here this morning with us for this presentation. And while we're not jointly, uh, we're not convened jointly at this time, I will certainly uh, allow for questions um, to Dr. Cody uh, from and questions and comments from commissioners uh, that are participating in this part of the meeting. So with that said, again, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sure what happened earlier um, with my we did. Everything seemed to be fine yesterday. I don't. I don't know what happened with the, with my um, microphone. But hopefully, you guys all heard that. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Dr. Cody at this point for his presentation, and then we'll have an opportunity afterwards for questions and comments. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cody. And uh, whenever you're ready, you may begin. All right. Thank you. Hopefully, everybody uh, can hear me. And uh, you're looking at a screen with um, that has a, a slide that reads Emirate 2020 estimates overview. Yep, you're good. Okay, good. Um, um, I'll just start by saying 2020 uh, presented uh, challenges in terms of data collection. I mean, not just at the federal level, but at the state and regional levels as well. And um, it was acknowledged and recognized early on. Uh, by our state partners, as well as um, NOAA and our regional partners, that we would have to monitor the situation in 2020 uh, pretty closely and, um, you know, be, be careful with, with um, how we, we uh, proceeded with estimation. So that said, I'll just uh, give you a, a brief overview of what I hope to cover in, in the uh, presentation today. Uh, the main points really are 2020 uh, catch and effort estimates. And the point I wanna make at the onset is that in general, there were no real unexpected or extreme results um, that we experienced um, as a result of imputation. Um, 2020 typically was in line with previous years, uh, the previous two years in particular, and the impact of data cap gaps and imputation uh, varied across the states and fishing modes, but was limited on, on the annual and regional levels. And hopefully I'll be able to show a little bit of um, some examples of that. I mean, obviously when you are um, drilling down through the data, you can expect uh, increasing variability as you increase the resolution of the estimate that you're trying to produce. So it, would, it's not unexpected to see more variability as you as you drill down in the data away from the annual or regional level. So I hope to give a review of the data gaps from uh, COVID-19. Um, I'll follow up then with uh, um, a description of data imputation and estimation methods, and then a brief overview of the catch and effort estimates. And what I've tried to do, do in this is to compare to recent years um, and then also allow for a comparison of imputed versus non-imputed records and then give you an overview of our, our next steps that we see um, going forward. So 2020, as I said, presented some <clears throat> major challenges in terms of uh, data collection. Um, I would say from the Emirate perspective, the majority of the challenges were associated with the access point angler intercept survey. And that's not surprising since it's an in-person survey that's conducted in the field and involves an interaction uh, between the sampler and, and the angler. 
uh, for the um, effort surveys, which are done remotely by uh, telephone and by uh, mail, um, those proceeded as normal, uh, I would say. Uh, there were a few hiccups here and there where you had uh, staff, contracted staff that were involved in the um, data processing components of the FES, the Fishing Effort Survey, uh, some scares related to testing positive for COVID. But um, we worked with uh, RTI, which is the, the company that's um, doing the telephones or the mail survey um, to ensure that uh, there were no gaps there. Um, one thing I will point out that is that even though uh, the effort surveys continued more or less un uninterrupted, there, um, there are components of the access point angular intercept survey that feed into the effort estimates. So the access point angular intercept survey collects some information in the field that uh, gets at off frame effort. So effort that we're not accounting for in our, in our telephone or mail surveys. So that obviously would be impacted by um, breaks in data collection. Um, that said, um, the Wave two was probably the most problematic in terms of data gaps. Um, primarily April, I would say, uh, but the, we did see a slowdown starting as early as mid March and continuing uh, beyond that. But for the most part, part, most states had resumed sampling at some level um, by by May, sometime in May. There were some other states that had. Um, more strict protocols in terms of um, social distancing and safety measures um, that uh, didn't uh, get back in the field fully until uh, later in the year. And three of those states were Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, and Virginia. Um, but by and large, those states too had resumed sampling by August 1 or mid July in some cases. Uh, the headboat mode was impacted uh, throughout the year. Um, no, and at my last uh, briefing, the the states had not resumed headboat sampling at this point. The ATSI portion, I think there were some some attempts by the states, some states, to um, to restart the ATSI observer program, but um, the social distancing measures were difficult under those circumstances, and that that sampling has not resumed. And this uh, applies really to the mid Atlantic and the New England regions. In the southeast, uh, we have the Southeast Regional Headboat um, Sampling or Survey. And that has not resumed in terms of biological data collection, but there is a, a field component that is ongoing, and that's the validation of the reported trip information. So, it's a little bit of a busy graph, but the take home is that um, to give you a picture of what, when and where the data gaps were. So if you look uh, on the vertical axis on the uh, far left, you'll see there are uh, numbers and they correspond to months. And um, on the top um, horizontal, Axis, you'll see there are different regions. So we're starting out with New England, and then we head into the Mid Atlantic and the South Atlantic and the Gulf states. And you can see in the South Atlantic and the Gulf states, sampling um, occurs year round, obviously, but um, the gaps um, are, are, are evident, particularly in April and uh, somewhat in May, also and June for some of the other states. And as I pointed out, you know, uh, Virginia, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, and some other states, um, uh, to a lesser extent, New Hampshire, um, didn't weren't able to resume sampling until later in the year. Um, the boxes represent um, a comparison to the previous two years. So basically, what you're looking at here is. Um, the more similar sampling levels were to the average for 2017 through 2019, um, you would have the green color. And as you have um, less of a, a, a well, say less relative sampling, um, you you know you go towards uh, the brown color. 
So you can see for the most part, there are some gaps uh, throughout the year, but for the most part, um, sampling um, occurred to some level um, following uh, the, the major shutdown uh, in April. And uh, this, this really is evident in, in all of the regions. So, and this, this graph itself uh, just shows you angular intercepts. So it's really comparing the numbers, the relative number of uh, angular intercepts for 2020 versus the previous three years. Just moving along here, um, in terms of links and weight measurements, and we, we, we did have quite a few inquiries from our state partners and, and also stock assessment folks as to what the uh, extent of the um, data gaps would be um, as far as an impact is concerned on weights and lengths. And, and here you can see a, a similar graph to what we showed, what I just showed you for the intercepts. And what we're doing here is um, comparing lengths collected in 2020 versus um, the previous, an average for the previous uh, three years. And as I said, green is good. Um, anything, um, any other color really is, uh, I, won't, I won't say suboptimal because you have years where um, there's variation uh, that you would expect. So not every year will have the exact level of sampling. Um, that the average would have. But you can see for the most part, there are some gaps that persist throughout the year. And, um, you know, there, and that's probably to be expected because uh, samplers ha had a difficult task in trying to conduct an interview. And that gets even more difficult when it comes to observing um, what's in the cooler. So that means you have to get close enough to the anger to uh, touch his uh, or her catch and uh, handle the catch. So in some cases, uh, some of the states um, had protocols in place that that um, really made that um, difficult. And this is a similar graph again for weights, and you can see uh, there are gaps throughout the year, but for the most part, um, once we head into June and beyond, uh, there's a, um, a fair amount of sampling that occurred for the weights as well as the lengths. So that's really just to give you um, uh, sort of a visual um, representation of where the data gaps were. And uh, as you see, largely it was towards the end, middle and end of wave two and the start of wave three. So we we're talking about March, April and May, June. So as far as uh, data imputation and estimation, um, we uh, worked fairly closely with the states and um, some of the state directors are here and Mike Penton is here today that I was, uh, I was given the opportunity, which I'm very grateful for, to participate in the state directors meetings that Mike held monthly. So I was able to get uh, feedback from the states on how sampling uh, was going uh, development of their protocols for um, getting back in the field and so on. So that was very helpful to us. We uh, developed a, a tracker, sampling tracker, a status tracker, um, in association with the different uh, FINS and ACCSP. So we, we looked at the West Coast, the Gulf, and also the uh, Atlantic Coast and uh, tracked, tried to track or um, to monitor uh, sampling levels throughout the year. Um, so, as far as imputation is, is concerned, um, we had information on where the gaps were, uh, the extent of the gaps uh, in terms of uh, where, where we had uh, data loss. So, we looked at a number of different methods for imputation to try and fill these data gaps, realizing that um, no imputation method is going to be entirely satisfactory because you are substituting data that wasn't collected with data from um, outside the, the data collection period. So that's less than ideal in most cases, but it is a standard practice for large scale surveys where there are data gaps that occur. So assumptions are made based on the representation of the data and, um, uh, you know, and, and those are, are presented. 
So what we did was we looked at all APIS data from 2018 and 2019 uh, collected within the corresponding 2020 data gap periods. And uh, we combined those with the 2020 data. So we only, to, to limit the effect of imputation, we restricted our um, use of the 2018-2019 data to where there were data gaps, where there was no data. So that limited the amount of additional data that was um, included in the 2020 data set. Um, the original sample weights, since we used two different years, 2018 and 2019, um, the original sample weights for a single year were downweighted by a factor of two to take into account that we were using two different or two separate years of data. Um, we also discussed the method that in detail with our uh, MRIP consultants. And we have um, a number of consultants that work with us. Uh, we have uh, Lynn Stokes from uh, Southern Methodist University in Texas. We have uh, Ginny Lesser up at Oregon State, uh, Jill Deaver at RTI, and then um, we have from um, Westat, um, which is a, a research firm in uh, Rockville, Maryland, uh, Jean Opsmer and uh, Mike Brick. So we discussed our methods or our, our approaches with, with the consultants and they had no major concerns with the methodology that was being used um, in terms of its, um, you know, it, it's, it, its adequacy um, to address the data gaps. And, and then the other thing, point I want to make too is that there was um, some information that was out there that we were going to limit the availability of data to the annual level, but uh, that's not the case. We have been able to produce a standard two wave or two month wave uh, level estimates using our standard MRIP methodology for both catch and effort. So the uh, 2020 estimates are available um, right now at the, the wave level as well as the annual level. So just moving along here, uh, just to give you some other, other considerations or some of the other things we did think about, uh, we did discuss the uh, different approaches to imputation and we went with the, the simplest method basically because it had the least impact on the um, survey design, uh, the estimation process based on the survey design. So it, it deviated less from um, our standard methodology than other more complicated or more complex methods would have. Uh, the other thing to consider as well when you look at modeling based approaches is the need for auxiliary information to either inform or at least substantiate some of the assumptions that you would have to make um, regarding the, the models that you use. So um, we weren't terribly comfortable with the idea of using auxiliary information, largely because um, different data sets are available and how you weight those data um, can vary depending um, on what, what assumptions you have and also can impact the results that you get. Um, and so there's, there's a potential for um, results that are a lot more difficult to interpret relative to the current methodology. Um, that said, though, we did attempt to obtain some auxiliary information uh, early on when uh, the data gaps were most pronounced. Uh, unfortunately, there's no real way within the federal system to expedite um, changes to a, a large scale survey uh, quickly. Um, there are um, paperwork reduction act considerations and reviews that have to be conducted. And we, the presentation that we made to the, the OMB uh, office of management and budget. Um, with respect to the changes that we would wanted to make to the uh, APIS survey um, were rejected. They, they felt that the, the gain really wasn't um, greater than the, the impact it would have had on the survey. So unfortunately, we were not able to get 
those auxiliary uh, information. Um, and uh, one of the recommendations also from the consultants and in, in, in discussion with the consultant consultants is that we should revisit the estimates following the 2021 year um, because what we have done, what we have used it are the two previous years. So 2019 and 2021 represent more proximate years and um, there's less likelihood of perpetuating a trend that may have ended uh, in the previous years. So I, I have some um, graphs that I want to show you and I'll just try to set them up here ahead of time uh, for catch and for effort estimates as well. But what I have are, are two sets of, of graphs. The first is a set um, of showing the 2018 to 2020 time series. So you can compare imputed estimates with what we got for 2018 and 2019. And then the second set is a follow up to that where we compare the um, estimates with the imputer records included and without the imputer records. So you can see them side by side to get a, an idea of the effect of imputation. And, and these are at the annual level uh, by state and region for, for just a handful of species. And um, fair warning here, I include the Gulf and the South Atlantic as well as uh, New England and the Mid-Atlantic for, for this um, um, set of graphs. So the first set here is from the Gulf and there are a number of different species, dolphin, gag, gray snapper, uh, triggerfish, greater amberjack, king mackerel, et cetera, uh, for the Gulf of Mexico. And what you see here are sets of graphs for the different states. You have Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi. And um, in each case, you have a 2018, a 2019, and a 2020 estimate. So the, the greenish color is the um, 2020 estimate, the reddish color 2019, and the blue is 2018. And side by side, um, you can see these estimates um, are, are fairly similar in terms of their um, the extent or the, the magnitude of, of the estimates. And um, across a, a number of different species, as I said, these are at the annual level, annual state level. At the wave level, there is increasing variation, and obviously you would expect to see a greater impact from imputation in some waves versus another um, for these estimates. So here we see uh, 2020 again, and you've got the uh, imputed estimate here in the blue again, and you have the non-imputed or without imputed um, data included, and the estimate is beside, uh, they're, they're side by side for the three different states. And you can see that in, in general, the estimates are, are fairly similar. Um, I can't say there's a trend towards lower or higher. Uh, it's species dependent in the case of the Gulf of Mexico. But in general, the estimates were um, at the annual level and state level, um, there's a minimal impact from uh, imputation. And moving along to the South Atlantic, we have a number of different states here. We have Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina in that order. And we have black sea bass, uh, dolphin, gray snapper, gray triggerfish, uh, king mackerel, red drum, Spanish mackerel, and spotted sea trout. So the side by side, you see 2018 through 2020 estimates. And you can see for some species, um, the estimates have trended downwards. Uh, whereas with other species, um, the estimates are, are larger. In the case of Spanish mackerel here, there's a larger estimate for 2020 relative to the previous two years. Um, that's, that's not unexpected because Spanish mackerel, um, for instance, is a is somewhat of a pulse fishery. So you can have a large number of intercepts with catch or a large proportion of intercepts with catch. Uh, concentrated to a, a relatively short period or a wave um, that can result in a large uh, overall annual estimate. So moving along here to a comparison of imputed versus um, without imputed uh, data. 
for both um, for the for the South Atlantic, um, you can see the the impact of the imputed data is uh, uh, minimal. And I'll I'll point your attention again to Spanish mackerel on the second uh, graph from the bottom on the right, and you can see that even though we had a very large estimate in 2020 for or for catch total catch or landings, we can see that um, this wasn't due to the inclusion of imputed data in the uh, in the estimation. So you can see side by side here these. These estimates are are very similar. So moving along here. Okay, now it decides to highlight for me. Anyway, that you can see Spanish mackerel highlighted there. All right, so moving along here to uh, New England and the Mid Atlantic, we have um, a couple of uh, a few different species that we're we're representing. Um, for New England. Um, for the various states, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, uh, the estimates are, are shown uh, side by side for Atlantic cod, Atlantic mackerel, black sea bass, bluefish, and haddock. And, and by and large, there are, there are no real surprises here. Um, black sea bass is up a little bit from 2019 um, in Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island was able to continue their sampling uh, throughout the year, but there's there's no real um, I would say uh, unexpected um, changes in trends from the previous two years. Uh, moving along to the mid Atlantic, we have Atlantic croaker, black sea bass, uh, bluefish, and the states Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, Virginia, and New York are are shown on uh, in each of the graphs, and you can see for um, the only one that really pops out is bluefish for New York, and you can see that there's a, a substantial drop in landings from 2019 to 2020. But you also note that in 2018, um, um, the the catch estimates compare pretty uh, favorably or similarly to the 2020 estimates. And then a comparison of uh, side by side imputed and non imputed. Um, you can see for in the case of New York, if we go down to that bottom graph again for uh, bluefish, you can see that the the impact of imputation on the overall estimate was minimal. And by and large, um, the estimates uh, varied, you know, very little at the annual level. I will say that there was, you know. Quite a bit more variation at the uh, wave level. So moving along here to the effort estimates, and as I mentioned, the effort survey itself was conducted uh, throughout the year. We did have a few um, minor stops, I think in New, uh, New York in particular, uh, because of um, a regulated shutdown of the for hire fishery uh, for. I think a month or so, and during that time we did uh, discontinue the uh, for hire telephone survey, um, but that resumed shortly uh, thereafter because basically the boats were not making trips, so there was you know to reduce the response burden on the captains, we uh, decided to um, just temporarily halt um, the phone calls. So for effort estimates, I have a similar sets of graphs. We have the annual effort by region and um, annual effort by region for charter and headboat modes uh, broken out. Um, this is different in the South Atlantic and the Gulf. There, there is only really one for higher mode. Uh, headboats are treated separately in a, in a different survey um, conducted by the Southeast uh, Science Center. And then we have um, a representation of the annual effort estimates uh, with and without uh, imputed records included. So um, this compares each of the regions side by side uh, in terms of the overall level of effort um, for EMRIP. And you have, so you have 2018, 2019, and then you have 2020, 
uh, including the imputed um, data from the APIS survey. So as I mentioned earlier on, the, the APIS does have a role in effort estimation, and that's to account for off-frame effort. It also has a role in determining the allocation of effort to different areas fish, state versus federal versus inshore waters. But for this purpose here, um, we're showing the, the impact on um, the overall level of, of estimation. So you, you can see that in the New England region, there's a slight uh, drop in the overall level of effort. In the mid-Atlantic, there is um, an increase. Uh, we didn't see that in the South Atlantic. It basically was stable with previous years. And in the Gulf of Mexico, um, we see that there's a, a slight increase in effort. And, you know, and that's, there is anecdotal evidence uh, available for increased effort as sort of a, a, a way for people to um, deal with the social distancing measures that were in place. Fishing um, obviously lends itself to um, getting out in the open in a safe manner and, and conducting um, an activity that's, that's uh, um, you know, pleasurable to people. So we, you know, there, there's, there are reports from the different regions that they, they saw increases in, in effort in, in different boat ramps and, and in different locations. So for charter and headboat effort, um, they're compared side by side in the first uh, set of graphs for New England and the Mid-Atlantic. We see that um, for the, when you break out the for higher uh, fleets, um, we don't see the same trend that we saw for private boat and shore modes. Um, we see a, a decrease in the amount of uh, trips that were made in 2020 versus um, 2019 and 2018. And um, that's, you know, based on reports given to us uh, through the for hire telephone survey uh, by the captains. So um, there's no reason to, to doubt that this would be a an accurate representation. Um, and the Mid-Atlantic, we see a similar, um, a similar trend for the, uh, but more pronounced with the charter mode than it is for the uh, headboat mode. Uh, in the South Atlantic, as I mentioned, we didn't have uh, a breakout. We don't break out those uh, for hire. It only includes the uh, charter mode. Um, headboat is treated separately. And in the South Atlantic, um, the numbers of anger trips stayed basically stable with what we saw in 2019 and, and 2018 also. There was a slight decrease in, in the Gulf of Mexico as well. So as I mentioned, the APIS has an impact on the effort estimates. And um, there were a couple of ways that we looked at the relative impact of imputed data. Uh, one was to um, apply the the APIS level adjustment to the the effort estimate um, without imputation. Uh, one was to do it with in, with full imputation, including the the borrowed data from 2018 and 2019, and then the other was to uh, um, basically limit the, the data included to uh, those that didn't include zero trips. So in other words, where there was where there were no gaps. So in the case in this case here, you can see uh, those three different um, uh, categories uh, side by side. And, and by and large in the Mid-Atlantic and New England where we um, where there were gaps, the differences between um, the uh, where we no imputation, imputation, and then excluding the zeros uh, is is minimal. Um, we didn't have any gaps in the South Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, and that's why you don't see that um, graph showing the um, the excluding the zeros, and, and that's at the annual level for for the region. So you know, obviously, as you drill down, you would expect more variation. 
So um, hopefully this gives you um, some some part of uh, an overview of the methods that we use. We're in the process right now of, of documenting the, the methods and producing a, a, a document that will um, uh, outline in detail uh, how we uh, proceeded with the, the imputation measures. Obviously, we have standard imputation methods that we use for lengths and weights, so um, it would be good to have some kind of a, a comparison where we can uh, show what we do normally versus what we did uh, for 2020. And what we did uh, similar in 2020 that we have been doing in our other in our standard imputation methods for lengths and weights, for example. So the next steps for us, um, the the estimates were released in mid April, and, and that um, coincided with our normal uh, release uh, schedule for the annual the finalized annual estimates. Um, they, as I said, they include annual and wave level estimates. Um, I, I will point out too that we did include. A, a metric in the query tool. So if you go to the query tool, you will see there's a percentage influence of imputed data on the overall estimate that's included along with each estimate. So um, data users have the opportunity to assess uh, the relative influence of imputed data on the overall estimate. So for instance, where there would be a complete data gap um, that value would be 100%. So only imputed data would be used in that case. Uh, anything less than that would mean that there were some data available from 2020 that we were able to include in that estimate. So hopefully um, that will be helpful to data users to at least assess the, the robustness of a particular estimate at a particular um, domain level. Um, we did have a, a communications rollout for the um, for the estimates, and I, I did hear from some state partners that they were a little bit surprised. They some people had thought that we weren't releasing estimates. Uh, we tried to make that you know fairly clear that we were you know going to do whatever whatever we could to make sure we had estimates for 2020. And that the methods we would present the methods uh, publicly as 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 best we could, but uh, obviously you know that message doesn't get to everybody. So even though there was a communications rollout, um, you know we we are uh, visiting the different councils and um, uh, presenting the methodology uh, to to interested parties, and we'll we'll continue that communications uh, with the different regions to. To make sure that message uh, gets out. So the the thing I mentioned earlier on is that we 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 have used uh, for the imputation process 2018 and 2019 data, and and that may not be uh, an issue, but it does warrant uh, the need for us to at least uh, evaluate um, using uh, more proximate years for uh, imputation. Um, and there are a couple of different reasons for doing that. Um, obviously, we we expect 2021 to be more like a normal year. Um, it it would be I, I think it 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 behooves us to to look at 2021 and 2019 as possible sources for imputed data uh, relative to 2018 and 2019 because they are uh, more proximate years. And there is some risk with including uh, less proximate years in, in any kind of an imputation process that you might get a, a trend that was uh, changing um, extended uh, another year uh, where it you know where it wouldn't be uh, representative. So you know we will revisit um, the estimation process at the end of uh, 2021. Um, we're hoping that it doesn't result in um, re-estimation or uh, changes to the estimates. My my sense is, you know, from talking to the team, that we don't uh, expect uh, the changes to be um, great. Uh, so we we may end up um, 
continuing just continuing with the 2018 2019. But uh, certainly we, we should take a look at that. So I think that's all I had. Uh, hopefully uh, this has been helpful. If, if you have, you know, if anybody here has uh, additional questions or some of the questions were that you have maybe weren't answered, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll try to address those questions as, as best we can. All right, thanks Richard. Um, I appreciate the, the, uh, the presentation. I'm sure that we're going to have some questions. Um, the first that I have for you kind of comes to your last point. So you're not expecting that there's going to be a great difference when you, when you look at 2021 in comparison to 2018 and 2019. But if there is a difference, uh, what's, what's the plan regarding, um, assessments that are being conducted now is there would would those assessments need to be redone or i mean it, it, are you guys talking about what the effects are going to be in the event that um there are differences that are enough that may affect assessments yeah mike yeah. that's that's a that's a good question um there, there is some time that we would have available to us obviously you know if 2020 is a terminal year um, it's unlikely that it's going to show up in an assessment, you know, until probably 2022 um, or, or later, sorry, 2023, probably. Um, but uh, that said, uh, we, we do have the ability to produce two sets of estimates side by side. So it, potentially you would have, you could um, use, use them as a, sort of a sensitivity analysis. Um, uh, to 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 look at uh, the effects of of the different years, but we hope you know we're not um, sitting idly by waiting for data to accumulate uh, to the annual level for 2021. 20, uh, we are going to start looking at um, the wave level estimates uh, to, for comparison purposes uh, within our office anyway. Um, to see if if there are any indicators in there that you know we're we're wrong about uh, the trend being very different for twenty uh, twenty uh, you know based on the new set of another set of imputed imputed data. So we'll 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 continue to look at that throughout the year as as more and more data from twenty uh, twenty one accumulate. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I do have a couple hands up from council members. I'm going to start with Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You just asked one of my questions, but I think the other question I have is probably more for the management side of the house. Um, you know, understanding that uh, there the limitations um, of the data. I'm I'm curious to know if the 2020 estimates are going to be used for for catch accounting purposes and for, you know, application of accountability measures and, and things like that. I mean, you know, given the, the minor differences, um, in the use of imputed data, um, you know, that's just a question I have. Uh, thanks. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I'm Michelle, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that. Um, what we've tried to do is, is try to anticipate. Some of the questions that management might have uh, related to how robust the data are, and you know, we we do provide that one metric on on the website uh, that gives you an idea of the relative impact of of imputed data on the overall estimate. So that can can provide at least a sense of whether uh, uh, managers feel the data are representative or or not. Um, they the the other thing is that you know that you know it will result in a bit more work on on our side to uh, um, look at some of the uh, underlying estimates or underlying data um, to see if there are any indicators in there that might um, help inform management management decisions. So you know right now, you know we're trying to. Um, at least present the data in a in a format where the caveats are are if not entirely known at least uh they're understood
Michelle, did you have a, your hand still up? Did you have follow up? On yeah, that? no, I just I appreciate Dr. Cody. I appreciate your answer and all the work that you and your staff have gone through to produce these estimates. And um, you're right. You're not, you know, it's not really your place to answer. I think, you know, I don't know if Mike Pentney has any thoughts on the use of these with respect to catch counting for, you know, mid Atlantic managed species, um, you know, and when we might see some results of that. That's all. Thanks. All right, thanks, Michelle. Um, I don't know if Mike, did you have anything you wanted to uh, offer to the, to Michelle's question? Have you guys been giving that any thought? Um, yeah, I mean, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, we have been giving it some thought. I just don't have a you know a good clean response right now. Um, it's definitely something that we're looking at and and trying to work through. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, Kate Wilkie, I saw your hand up and it, did it go? Did, did you put it down purposely? No, it's supposed to be up. It looks like it's up on mine. Let me, oh, okay. You know what? I scrolled down a little bit. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I have a question based on the graphs you showed and what you told us. It looks like the imputation didn't make a big difference in the estimates. But can you tell us a little bit about what the missing data and the imputation did to the uncertainty in the estimates? So you showed what looked like error bars, but it was a percent change as compared to the other series that were shown in the graph. So I don't really know how to interpret what that means in terms of uncertainty. And I'm also interested in the uncertainty related to the annual estimates versus the wave estimates. Yeah, um, we we do have the ability to um, to estimate uh, variances for the for the different uh, uh, domains or estimation domains. So those are those are available through the uh, query system, and um, by in general, uh, you know, in general, um, there's you know considerable overlap uh, between the imputed and the non-imputed um, estimates. Um, I'm trying to scroll back through the through the estimates that I have here. We we do have um, variance estimates shown for for the actual landings information uh, for imputed versus non-imputed. So if you look at at those graphs, actually no, it's not. It's the it's the trend changes. You're right. Um, but we do have a, a way to to estimate that, and, and that was one of the um, considerations when we when we tried to uh, when we looked at different methods for imputation. That um, this way, this method was consistent with with our estimation process, and we could use the the uh, variance estimators that we had been using um, to you know accurately portray that. Um, yeah, I apologize that I don't have it on these graphs here, but um, those are available through the query system, so you can see them side by side. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll have to follow up and look at those because I think that would be informative too to, to really understand um, the value of this 2020 data, especially when we're thinking about using it in management to follow up on Michelle's comments. Thank you. Sure. All right, thanks for that, Kate. Um, I'm going to take two more questions, comments, and then we'll go to the audience, uh, go to the public. I see um, James Fletcher has his hand up. So I'm going to go to Dewey and then Eric Reed, and then we'll go to James, and then we're going to have to call it because uh, we're pushing up against our time limitations at this point. Um, so let's go ahead next to Dewey Himmelwright. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cody, for your presentation. Um, earlier on, you said that there were uh, no extreme results. What would be your definition uh, of extreme, like a, a big gap or variance or something? That's one question. And then my second question, um, are, are you all considering this to be the best available uh, data? Thank you. 
Yeah, when when I talked about the um, you know extreme or unexpected uh, results, I was referring to the annual uh, estimates at the at the at the regional level. So uh, as I said, you know below below that level, you do see uh, you know additional variation as you would expect. Um, so you know I I would say there's no hard um, definition of of um, unexpected or or you know outlier type of information for for the estimates for this year, other than the comparison that we had there comparing uh, imputed with non-imputed data, um, if they varied uh, considerably or not. Um, we we will you know continue to look at different metrics that you can use to 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 get at that. But you know, I would say at this point, that's there's no hard definition that I would apply to that. It's it's basically that the estimates didn't blow up at the annual level for for the regional um, estimates. As I said, though, there are there is um, variation below that level and at the state level and wave level, or uh, you know, depending on the the estimation domain that you look at, and and those are. Um, consistent, fairly consistent with what we see in, in other years at those levels. And then as far as best available uh, science, I, we don't make that determination in, in my office. We present the data, uh, try to present the caveats as best we can so that uh, they can be considered um, in, you know, if if they are to be considered or any kind of BSIA determination. So, you know, we, we present those data and let the process take care of the rest. Hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does, there, Dewey? Yeah, it does but, but is there some, well, it answers it. Somewhat. Yeah. Thank you. Do we, you do bring up you do bring up a good point though. I I think that we can probably provide um, perhaps a, a, an outline to data users and and managers as to the kinds of caveats that that they should be looking for, and perhaps um, you know a description of the data that will um, you know better portray that. So I, I think we can we can work on on having that available. All right, thanks, All right. Richard. Thank you, uh, Eric Reed. I've got you next, and then we'll go to James Fletcher, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on. So go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Presentation. So my question is about the uncertainty or the robustness of the data, and whether to use it or not. And a couple of the previous speakers already touched on it a little bit, but if you query effort data from Maine to Virginia, you, and the average PSC for all modes combined and all oceans combined, which to me is, is a, a measure of robustness, in 2018, the average was uh, 18. In 2019, it was 16.4, and in 2020, it was 15.5, which is the, the, the lowest PSC in the time series. So I'm really having an issue on figuring out why we would not use 2020 data, given in my mind, what is the most robust out of those three years? So any any feedback on that? Thank you. Um, well, as I said, the the, the effort uh, component or the effort surveys were able to continue uninterrupted largely. So you know those estimates should be pretty good, uh, and we are seeing probably some of the effects of in, increased sample size that we put in place uh, a couple of years ago um uh, coming into play so there you know there are there are some considerations there um you know i i i don't see any reason the effort estimates wouldn't be used um there there is that caveat though that i pointed out that the um there is a, a component there are a couple of components of the the access point angular intercept survey that are used to inform um, how that effort is allocated among areas fished. So, for instance, 
Um, we use the, the access point angler intercept survey to find out from anglers where they fished, where the majority of their fishing occurred. So, and that's used to, to let us know how much of the effort went into the federal versus the state versus inland waters. So that would be a, a consideration. Um, and then the other part is the off frame effort. So out of state uh, folks, for instance, or non-coastal residents wouldn't be included in the um, the sample draw for the, the fishing effort survey. And so that could have an impact, but we think that the impact is probably less than um, than anticipated because uh, you're talking about tourism that was impacted by, or there's some indications that it was impacted early on at least, uh, waves two and three uh, for the for hire fleet, but not so much with, uh, well, and, and also for the private boat, but um, that was compensated by an increasing effort throughout the year. So there, there are some caveats and some considerations, and we'll we'll do our best to lay them out there so managers can take a look at them. But you are right; the the precision level for 2020 is you know comparable or or better than it had been in previous years. Anything to follow up, Eric? I see your hand fill up. No, no, thanks. Okay, I appreciate the question and answer. Um, all right, I'm going to go to the public real quickly. Um, at least I see one member of the public with their hand up, James Fletcher. Go ahead, uh, James, you can ask a question or provide a comment if you'd like. Thank you, sir. Magnuson Act of 206, Public Law 109-479 requires every Marine District recreational angler to register with the federal government through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Can MREP give me a definitive number of the marine recreational anglers? That's question one. And question two, if you, the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council required every recreational fisherman and the EEZ to report electronically, would that reduce the estimates that you are currently putting out? Thank you. Um, there are well, two questions there. The first one I'll try to address uh, as best I can. I, I know, you, uh, James, I think you've been dealing with, um, uh, with Gordon Colvin, and I know he was uh, generating a response to your, your question on on the uh, National uh, Saltwater Registry. But I will point out that you know, a lot of the states have memorandums of under understanding with uh, NOAA. And so they're exempted from uh, the National Saltwater Registry because they have their own licensing system in place. Uh, that said, um, there, it's very difficult to produce uh, an accurate estimate of the numbers of participants in the fishery. And, you know, we uh, discontinued uh, producing uh, participation estimates um, in our last uh, version of the fisheries of the US for, for that very reason. Uh, the methodology that we're using was outdated and um, it just wasn't possible to produce a, an accurate uh, measurement. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service are expected to uh, produce a participation estimate um, with their new methodology that I think they will unveil in 2023, but before that, there, we won't probably have a, an updated uh, participation estimate. Um, there are some caveats to Magnuson, I think that Gordon may have addressed in his response to you. Um, and so I, I, I'm not that familiar with what, what the, uh, the, what his response was, but uh, I will say that, um, those memoranda with the different states uh, do exempt them from um, enrolling their anglers in a national uh, program um, if they provide data to NOAA on a regular basis, which all of them are, are doing right now. Um, the second question, there's no way of knowing uh, whether at this point, 
whether the estimate of uh, effort would be uh, different for if you used uh, anger reports versus um, a, a survey like we're using right now. Um, the expectation is that you would still have to address uh, off frame effort. So not every angler that goes fishing is going to have a license. Um, there are exemptions in place currently for many states. So for under 16 and for over 65 different military, um, just depending on, on the state. So I, I think, you know, it'd be very difficult for me to, um, to surmise that there would be a, a difference at this point. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that Emirate doesn't doesn't estimate participation, so you know we won't have a comparable number there if if everybody was required to be permitted. So hopefully that helps uh, address your question. But I would say look for Gordon's uh, response. I, I know that he was working on it. All right, thanks, Richard. I appreciate the response um, and all of the responses to the questions that we had from council members and the public. Um, at this time, I just want to thank you again for for presenting the information. We'll look forward to updates as as we move on uh, throughout this year into next year. And uh, I just appreciate your time this morning uh, spent with us. So thank you again. Um, all right, all right.